I'm here today to support your ideas, encourage your passion, and hopefully ignite the fire under your feet to take action. I grew up in the inner city of Chicago in a low-income neighborhood. My mother had 13 kids, Kanisha, Katara, Lashana, Jamie, Elizabeth, Crystal, James, Naomi, Stephen, Daniel, Tisha, Timothy, and Joseph. Whew. She almost had a rap song just calling us down to eat for dinner. It was times that we didn't have a lot of money and our resources were very limited, and times that we did have heat, we had to supplement that heat with a kerosene heater. And I remember, so I know personally what it feels like to be a rotisserie chicken. I know I'm not joking because we had a little bit, the heater's right here. Now you can't heat your whole body. You have to rotate a little bit at a time. And you can't have the blanket on because you don't want the blanket to catch fire. But that's the area and some of the memories I had growing up in poverty on the south side of Chicago. There was times when it would rain, the rain would go through the roof, through the second floor, down to the first floor, and we were still filling up pots and pans and buckets. And that was before they had the little sign on the buckets that five-gallon buckets may cause kids to fall over and topple over. Yeah, that was before that. Growing up on the south side of Chicago, it was time to go to middle school. And when I would get ready to go to middle school, I remember my mother looking at me and my face. And you could see the joy and the pain at the same time because she knew she had to send me to school. And we had to walk. And the reason why it was sad to walk across the street, because there are buildings that were abandoned there for a long time since MLK riots. And so I had to walk to school. And when I would walk to school with my siblings, there were jelly pools of blood on the ground. You shouldn't have to think about that before you go to get your education. Kind of hard to think, kind of hard to learn. By the time it was time for high school, I had great ambitions. I wanted to go to a private school. I took the test, I studied, I believe what my mother told me. You can be anything that you want to be. And I was passionate about education because she told me that education was the one thing that people could not take from you once you obtained it. So I wanted to go to school. But that scholarship didn't cover the cost, the transportation on the bus there to school and back every day. So what was I left with? I went to Inglewood High School on the south side of Chicago. When I went to Inglewood, there were gangs there on every side, all different types of gangs at school, and they would have gang wars. And if you didn't have, wasn't a member of the gang, they would beat you until you decided to join or take a side. So the gang, joining the gang wasn't just, oh, I want to be cool, I want to wear this do-rag, I want to look cool, no. It was because if I wanted to go to school, I had to join in order to be safe. Now, the doctors told my mother when I was born, I was born with a heart murmur. And they told her, they said, your daughter probably would never be able to run. But here I am. I'm jumping fences. I'm low cross. I figure I might as well join the track team. And something happened. When I joined the track team, I ended up winning MVP of the track team. Go figure. Go figure. I won MVP of the track team, and I wasn't supposed to be able to run? But then I had to join that gang. And the gang seemed so cool because I didn't have a lot of resources. I didn't have good coats. So the gang members, they bought me a new coat. They gave me a new name. I was the bone crusher of 59th. Now, as small as I was at 15 or 16 years old, you know I wasn't a bone crusher, but it sounded really good at the time. So here I am joining this gang. And what was the result of joining the gang? Just to go to school? Not to be cool. They came to tell me that I had to do things that they wanted me to do, even though that compromised my integrity and moral courage. My mother was no longer my, 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 my inspiration out there on the street because I didn't have anywhere else to go. And one day the gang members, they came and they told me to beat up my best friend. I didn't want to do that, that was my best friend. She was on the street too, her, my parents had abandoned her. She didn't have a place to go. All the girls in the gang had to do what they told them to do, so we came out to go get Carol, and Carol's on the street. Carol grabs a bottle, we were all dressed the same. And Carol took that bottle to protect herself. And out of all the girls that was out there, who did she stab? Me. I ended up having my artery severed. And here I am bleeding on the south side of Chicago, about to die, taking the orders of some gang members that told me to do this, and if I didn't do what they told me, the penalty would be worse. So what did I do? Because they said they were my new family. I asked them for a ride. Can I get a ride to the hospital? Get me to the hospital. And I remember the words that those men told me. They looked me straight in the face, and they said, folks, you ain't going to be bleeding in my lap. 
my life wasn't as valuable as the interior of this man's car. But they told me to do this. I went to the hospital, my mother, she talked to me and she told me never to give up. I had ideas, I was passionate about a lot of things. But here I was about to lose my life at age 16. When I got out of the hospital, not one of the gang members came to visit me while I was in. My mother didn't even have the time to really come and visit me because she had 13 kids. I wasn't her only child, so she didn't even have the money to get up there to see me in the hospital. But I remember the words that she used to give me, the encouraging words that she told me never to give up, the passion that she showed in her daily activities with her children. But when I got back, I couldn't change my neighborhood because I didn't have the resources and neither did my mother to go to a better neighborhood to get a better education. So I had to go exactly where I grew up and exactly where that violence happened. One day the gang came out, I started telling kids I had an epiphany. I start telling young teenagers, you don't have to join a gang, it's not all it's cracked up to be. I start telling young girls, you don't have to be with all these guys in order to join, you could do something better. The gang didn't like that very much. I remember them pulling me out of my house, putting my hands on a fence, they got a young man to come out and beat my hand with a bat three times for love, life, and loyalty so I could remember to keep my mouth quiet and not to talk and do, talk against the gang. My teachers told me I thought they would give me a better, a better way of doing things. I thought they would give me leeway when I went back to school, but they didn't. They said, you made this decision. I ended up learning to write with my left hand, and I didn't graduate. I started school with 620 freshmen my freshman year. Only 114 of those people graduated. But I'm grateful to stand here before you today and say that I was one of them. Because I had an idea. I had an idea that one day I could get out of this place if I got my education, if I believed what everybody told me, and I could change my neighborhood. I could change my neighborhood. I could do it. I had passion, I was really passionate about that. And you know, that thing, and, and that passion ignited me to take action. It put a fire under my foot. I started going to school no matter what. I went to college and it seemed like it was by accident because I went to pick up prom tickets, but they had a college there that took me out to that college and I ended up obtaining my degree. I joined the army for five and a half years and I said, you know what, I can do this. The army was easy, the street was hard. But then two and a half years I was a non-commissioned officer because I had an idea. I had passion. I had a passion that when I came back to my neighborhood, I would come back better and I would take somebody with me. I ended up coming to Spokane after Germany to change my community that was in and getting my education. I ended up being able, but I was young. I was young. And people would look at me and they would say, oh, what experience do you have? What experience do I have? Oh, yeah, she's too young to have experience to be on this committee. And I would think in my head, what kind of experience do I need? Juggle dishes blindfolded while riding a unicycle? What experience? Too often young people are written off, not allowed to join committees. Or if we add them on our committees, they're usually the kids that look like us, that talk like us, they use the same vocabulary as us. We don't look to get a diverse group of kids to say, what can we do to make it better? We have a national dropout rate but we go to kids that are in school to ask them why those kids are dropping out. Interesting. All of my experiences caused me to listen to, to, to be able to start a nonprofit that end up serving over, over 300 teens a month. I didn't have a lot of money, but I had passion. I had enough passion about this subject that I could get some other adults and some other teenagers to come and make a difference with me. I had enough passion to ignite the fire under their feet so they could make a difference and come out and volunteer with me because I didn't have any money to pay these people to change anything. I didn't have a lot of support because I looked so young. I thought that was a good thing to look young. People pay to get surgery to look young. And here I am trying to look older, wearing longer hair, buying bigger wigs, wearing older suits just so I could be accepted at the table. Something happened. I started this nonprofit with just myself and another mother. I started looking at people and the kids that will hang out at the local bus station, and there were so many of them, and they would say, these kids aren't doing anything. 
But when you go across the country, most nonprofits are there. You have agencies for kids from the time that they're born until they're age 14. But when they get in high school, ooh-wee, you don't want to deal with them anymore. But the kids end up making a logo for that nonprofit. They end up recruiting their friends. We end up serving 300 teens a month and making a difference. And I want to encourage everybody here today that's listening that you don't change the world by jumping out in the middle of, 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 of take on a big, big project. You can start right there with your kids, your own kids, and letting them bring their friends in. Because guess what? Their friends are in the next city, the next state, and the next continent. But you say, how do I find my passion? Well, I'm going to tell you. One, find out and ask yourself. This is how you find out. You ask yourself, what is the biggest problem facing the world today? And then you ask yourself, self, what can I do to change it? What can I do to change it? It may not be anything big, but you can change it. Don't Google it. Don't listen to anybody else and what anybody else says is the biggest problem facing the world because if you can't wrap your, your, uh, your passion around, you can't be passionate about something that somebody else came up with. It has to be something that you yourself are passionate about. The second thing I had to do in order to make a change inside of my community and eventually the world because those kids are going to go out somewhere, I had to express continual belief in my dream. I had to tell everybody my idea. Anybody I met, I told them about my ideas to change the way the world was working for at-risk youth. I started raising the voice of where they were and how they didn't have resources and they couldn't afford sports passes in school. I expressed continual belief. My ideas, I shared them everywhere I went. The next thing I had to do, I had to get rid of naysayers as close friends. You know, the ones who tell you, oh, you can't do that. Oh, well, you came from Chicago. Oh, you're not from this town. Oh, you're too young. Oh, you're too old. Oh, you're too bald. Oh, you're too short. Because the same people that can tell you, you can't, you shouldn't, you won't. Why can't they say you can, you will, and do it? So once I removed those naysayers as close friends, I started doing a little research about that thing that I was passionate about. And I found a mentor. Why did I need a mentor? Because somebody has already made the mistakes. I personally went to do this nonprofit, and I was working for years telling people about this great agency that I started. It took me five years to realize it was an after-school program. <laughs> so what you need to do is find somebody who's been down that path and have made those mistakes for you and can mentor you in the right direction. What was the next thing I had to do? I had to come to a realization that it will always cost more than the monetary resources that I have, and it will always take longer than I anticipated to take. Because being a young person, I'm telling you, I thought if I wanted to do something, all I had to do was tell somebody it was going to happen. No, I had to build up some capacity for resilience to know that everything was not going to fall on the floor and I wasn't going to walk into an agency and be the president of it within five uh, days. Okay, one day, I really felt I could do it in a day. But that's not going to happen. And when you understand that and you have that understanding in your mind, you can say, you know what? I'm not going to quit no matter what. I'm passionate about something and I'm going to change my community. I'm going to change the world one person at a time. And I also had to realize that success was not measured in the amount of money that I made, nor was it measured in the type of car that I drove. It was measured in what made me come alive. And what made me come alive was seeing young people who made a difference in that nonprofit, who recruited their friends when I didn't have the money to get somebody to design this great logo. I got a kid to create a logo that was so cool that other teens wanted the T-shirt, even when it was an agency. It wasn't anything, some, some cartoon character or some cool comic book character. It wasn't that. But that young man, he was proud of that work that he had done. And so with that being said, never let go of your ideas. Find your passion and let your passion ignite the fire under your feet to take action. Thank you for listening.